Good afternoon, viewers, and uh, welcome to once again another edition of the Enterprise Uganda Business Forums. Now, in these forums, we are discussing practical ways on how you can weather the COVID-19 storm. And, um, of course, in the previous shows, we've uh, picked experiences from people who are actually in business, who are facing this every day, who have had to contend with new realities under COVID. I am Charles Bode, your host, and as usual, we have a business coach, uh, Charles. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Very good. Charles Ochichi is the executive director of Enterprise Uganda and is here to, you know, give us um, professional advice. He's the man who puts the things in context after picking them from, you know, the practitioners of business. And I hope and pray that this show adds a thing or two or many on your business aspirations. Charles, um, uh, briefly, I think let's begin with um, where we stopped last time. Um, mm. uh, quickly, if you to give our viewers, those that missed especially, and those that watched and probably didn't pick some of the points, a digest of what we talked about last week. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I want to thank the moderator and thank him NTV for giving Ugandans this afternoon for reviewing some of the things you need to get right to do business. The mission of Enterprise Uganda is to create local entrepreneurs who perfect their game in the business arena and proceed to become the finest they can ever be. Mm. And uh, a platform like this is useful because we then bring some of the testimonies of Enterprise Uganda's own customers and other individuals in the private sector who have gone through this route. And then we teach Ugandans what they have done and most importantly, how they can replicate what these people have done right mm. and also how they can avoid what has not been exactly correct. In the first edition, we had the <coughs> Casita here and we also had the, uh, the lady from uh, Victoria Schools. Yeah. We saw that uh, the sector of the traders is where they make a lot of money, but how to make that money to now migrate to other areas of the economy was such a big issue. Yeah. And many of them ended up in one area, most of them thinking about real estate, and sometimes over-designing these properties, resulting into idle capital. Okay, that was a very interesting one, Charles, because mm -hmm. uh, really, really, one of the things that I gathered is that most of these guys tend to spread themselves so thinly yeah. Mm. And I think it works against them at some point. It does. And uh, the thing about uh, being in real estate, I mean, in trade, trade sector is that money is coming in every day. Yeah. And if you are not sober and able to manage that resource, yeah. you'll find that every day also you're also spreading it and mm. spreading it and spreading it. Yeah. Along the way, you are even endangering your own trading area. Mm. You've been number one in, uh, for example, electricals. But the way you keep getting money from those daily sales and putting it wherever you're putting it, if you're not managing that very well, mm -hmm. you could actually endanger your superiority yeah. in that specific area where you're number one. Mm -hmm. So our first session gave us some of the tidbits that we saw from there that liquidity needs to be managed. Yeah. Investments need to be properly planned and managed. And it means, therefore, that people need to be taught on how to migrate from what you have been used to, to and then go into something that is different, but probably also very useful for this economy. And I wanted to connect that to the story of uh, the Lubegas, the fellows who are in charge of, who are having a lot of uh, malls in the city here, mm -hmm. including taxi parks. Mm -hmm. When they moved away from trading in garments and trying to now produce garments here, they couldn't manage, yeah. and they had to retreat to where they were used to. to. It was a different program. They couldn't manage it. Mm -hmm. Meaning, therefore, as the country considers getting our people to begin to be value-adding operators, it is not an announcement. Mm -hmm. It's a structured process where you take these people from a familiar ground mm -hmm. to getting into things they have not been doing. And that is something that you don't just pronounce and overnight it happens. Mm -hmm. Money could be there, but the skill, the patience, the technology, the ability to get the human resources to move you from one area to another area is not something that can happen overnight. Yeah. But when we left that, um, we then got some two interest interesting entrepreneurs. Yes. A young man and a young lady. 
people were taking over from the founding entrepreneurs of very successful enterprises. One was a lady mm. in Nina Interiors, mm. the other one's a gentleman mm. in Yugachik. Mm. And in both, we were able to discover some extremely interesting lessons. One of them on how to start the game of su succession planning as early as possible. Mm. You don't even need to announce it. You just have to say, please, young child, come to the business, come this way. And you are not doing that, selling them that, please, in future, you are taking over. Mm. Let them first come in with a soft, easy entry, and then you continue to tighten and tighten things, bring in principles, bring in values, bring in systems that will now make these people to fit in properly as the businesses get ready to receive the next generation of leaders. That was a very important uh, topic, Charles, because, mm. uh, of course, when we talk about the mortality rate of business in this country, mm. part of it is actually at the transition stage. True. Uh, you know, from the founder, mm. normally when they've passed on, yes. to a new generation. Mm. And I think that is very painful because most of the businesses that collapse at that level have already established themselves. Yeah. They're employing many people. Mm. and then they go under. I think uh, that mm. was a very, very important lesson for, and I'm sure a number of our business people out there were able to pick very uh, key lessons from that. In fact, I want to tell this to the viewers that most successful people in this city, in this country, mm. one of their biggest worries is how prepared is my family, the next generation, yeah. to keep the brand where it is. Yeah. It was tough already for a seasoned person to keep it where it was. Yeah. It will be much tougher yeah. for the next generation if they were not inched into the game mm. early enough mm. for them to pick up the ropes, to pick up the experience. So it's one thing to build an empire and hope that it will reward your family and the country. Mm. But quite another for you to imagine that just because the empire exists, the assets are there, that empire can weather the storm of competition. Mm the way you, the founder, did. And many times we have blamed our children. And I like the way Aga Sekalala Senior told me. He said, many times we, we tend to imagine our children should automatically fit into our shoes. And we forget that they should be given a chance to make errors when we are still there, mm -hmm. so that we can coach them, guide them, and let them know that this game can be mastered, and this game is not a game that Anybody can just say, because of the blood that you have, you automatically succeed. So Aga Sekalala Senior put it plainly. He said, let's not imagine that our children should just walk into this thing and find it flowing, and they start flowing with it. Mm. Let them have the opportunity to make the errors, opportunity to fall down and get up when you are still there, so that you can encourage them, build them, and keep them on the right track as they go into running a branded enterprise. I like the aspect of, uh, you know, managing siblings mm. in a business. Because, mm -hmm. you know, in a family, you have, you know, those characters who feel entitled. Yes. Uh, all of them may not, you know, have the same attributes mm. and the same values, or they may not actually mm. have it, the acumen of doing business. Mm. And how you deal with that, I think that was uh, a very, very important aspect. If you can take our viewers through some mm. of the things that came up, Yes, um, we, as you may recall from Patricia, she said she has got sisters, she has got the cousins, they are all at Nina Interior. Yeah. And whoever goes in there, they go in there with specific job descriptions. Mm -hmm. And they also get in there and fit into the, the required policies of the organization. Mm -hmm. And when you are working together in the, in the company, nobody is calling the other one sister, brother, mommy, you are simply saying, where is the general manager? Mm. Where is the manager procurement? Where is the manager in charge of this? Mm. And also, you remember what uh, uh, Aga Sekalala Jr. said. He said that so long as we can make sure that relatives come in there and have some positive experience, there's a chance that they can fit into the game. Mm. But you do not need to necessarily impose that kind of a game. Let them come in there. They first fit in areas where they can flow easily. And then along the way, you keep on exposing them to more skills and increasing the experience as they get into the business. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, dear viewers, our approach, we're looking at the entrepreneur himself, the person who's actually doing business. Because many a time, 
we tend to be carried away by the environment where this entrepreneur is operating. That's why you mm. see a lot of discussions about policy environment, mm. about government to Yambe and the like. But yeah. it begins with you, yeah. the entrepreneur. Uh, do you have it? Do you have what it takes? Because the environment is not going to fill in certain gaps for you. Very true. That is our approach. And on that note, viewers, mm. please allow me to introduce our special guest today. Mm. Again, another entrepreneur. This time, um, because, you know, Charles, a number of people tend to think that business happens around Kampala. Yes. But there's a lot of money out there. Yeah. Uh, Uganda is big and has a lot of potential in different areas. Yes. So I entrepreneur, I don't want to say much. I'll let it, uh, you know, give him the chance to introduce himself and tell us where he's coming from and what he's doing. Mm. You're most welcome, sir, on this show. Thank you, moderator, viewers, the executive director enterprise Uganda. I'm Thomas Oloya from Gulu City. I do farming as a business. Mm -hmm. Majorly, I'm in fish farming. Very good. The topic for this evening, uh, before I bring you in, Charles, mm -hmm. is um, we're trying to look at practical business tips on how to move from being a jobless youth to an owner of several successful businesses. And we're going to pick or to say this through Thomas's um, case study, or if you like, example or experience. Mm -hmm. Last week, we were talking about how you can elevate yourself from being an SME, a micro operator in that space to a global player. We had the story of Noma, and I think it was quite riveting yes. for yeah. our viewers. Charles? Yeah. Let me give you tidbits of what came out of the, no the, the Noma story. An exciting, exciting, typical journey of an entrepreneur. This one happened in Uganda, mm. but you could take this story, put it in any part of Uganda, of the world, mm. any part of Africa, and to be such a great story. Here is what came out of the Noma story. Number one, there were aspects to do with how to start a business and clearly from his story, starting a business is a messy game. It's not organized. Yeah. Now, in that messiness, if the following kind of things typical happen. Where you start, how you start, the amount of money you start with do not matter. What matters is getting started, <coughs> receiving customers, and improving along the way. Mm. Numa Robert started in Kabuohe using a machine fabricated by a local person. Yeah. And the kind of capital they had was so limited, mm. but that's how they started. Mm. Number two, again at starting point, starting out as a necessity entrepreneur does not necessarily stop you from transitioning into opportunity entrepreneur. Mm. This kind of language of defining entrepreneurs has been used a lot by academics saying, oh, you know, if you are the person who started because of out of necessity, you know, you're poor, you had no job, you'll remain doing petty things. Robert started as a necessity entrepreneur. He had nowhere to go. He had lost his job, but he transitioned from there to build an empire that today is exporting to the U.S., to Canada, and to the United Kingdom. The other thing that we learned for a beginner again from uh, Robert story was that there is no special market for a beginner. When Robert went into manufacturing of animal feeds, mm. he was competing with a seasoned producer of animal feeds. At that time, it was called Nuvita. Mm. And Nuvita today is gone. Noma is proceeding and doing a great job, actually shifting now to production of uh, food for human consumption. The other thing that we learned again at the story of Robert, especially at the stage of starting, that you will have to make painful sacrifices, even when you have limited resources. Mm. He produced the samples of his pro products. He had to give them free of charge to people for people to start testing and knowing whether they work. Mm. With the limited resources, you feel very pained. But that's the story. Nobody is going to buy from you until they have confirmed that your things work. Mm. So they are going to take the samples, and those samples you are not going to ask for money, and that is your capital. Very interesting experience there. The other one was that in business, it's important to have a shoulder to lean on, somebody who believes you, a mentor, somebody that will say, even if things have gone out of line, we are here and we believe in you, let's keep going. Mm. And for Robert, it was his wife. When the partner quit the partnership, he now had to fall back on his family and say, this is what has happened. Our friend has pulled out. What do we do? And the family said, let's keep moving. Mm -hmm. You need a mentor. You need a believer. And the other aspect, again, in terms of uh, a beginner is that uh, you will have to multitask. Robert was a marketer, a manufacturer, 
a purchaser, mm. a cashier, and was also a business M M M M MD, everything. Mm. In the beginning, those things are going to happen. Be ready for those things. Yeah. But then there were other aspects that we saw from that story, which were the second part was that the path to formalization is never easy. Never easy. Registering a business is just one of the steps towards formalization, but it takes greater effort for you to begin to move records into something meaningful, meaningful through analyzing them and using them for business management decisions. Mm -hmm. You also need formal business training in order to acquire the necessary business skills, especially in human resources, marketing, uh, leadership, all those aspects you need to acquire them. Persuasion, networking, Robert Sore brought out those ones. But you need, if there is an entity that which enterprise Uganda is, go there, acquire this quickly, and use them to grow. The other thing he, that came out was that even after Robert had picked up the ropes and had begun to know where he was going, shocks and challenges never end in business. Mm. Specifically, Robert said he lost his entire working capital in a business bus, uh, in a business trip when he was traveling in a bus, all the money was stolen. Mm. And nobody's bothered. You lose it, that's how it is. Yeah. The other one was that along the way, this factory that he built from scratch, using basic resources, it burned down. Catches fire, yeah. Challenges are part of the game. Mm. And Ugandans need to appreciate that. Then later, you also learned a few things that even when you have become an established known brand, you still have to continue paying the price mm. to become a global exporter. Yeah. One of the things he did was that he had to fulfill very stringent requirements of UNBS to become certified. And that opened to him doors to big outlets in Kampala and then to become exporter overseas. Also, when you have become established, you need strong human resources. But these human resources, you pick them according to what your money can afford. Robert had people from all over the the country, West Nile, Buganda, Western Uganda, all those were part of his team, but he also had Kenyans. Mm -hmm. And within the same story, he also brought out the aspect of integrity. And he specifically said that with strong integrity, you can access supplier's credit. With strong integrity, the banks can begin to come your way and give you resources. Mm -hmm. And then he had some final advice to, to government. He said that it's important when you're coming up with the policies that affect established businesses to consult and work with them. Mm. Because there was this issue of 1% on all the purchases from farmers. And farmers were saying, you man, you're a thief. We're mm. not going to give you our millet, our sorghum, no more. And Robert was at the verge of actually abandoning a milling enterprise and going into something else just because of that decision. Mm. And yet if that decision had been properly discussed, there would have been a way Robert would have said, okay, how do I accommodate this, but at the same time continue to work with my farmers? Thank you very much, Charles. Yeah. Well put. Uh, viewers, um, I'd like to encourage us to actually have a piece of paper and pen. I think it will do, because what yeah. we are discussing mm. are actually, it's not a conversation. It's actually tips mm. that you can pick out of here and help you, not just wither the COVID-19 storm, but help you in your business operations. Because... The, the values we are discussing here are business values that, you know, persist whether COVID or not. Very true. Mr. Lawyer, I'll move to you. Uh, what do you do? And uh, if you don't mind, just give us a bit of, you know, background of the business you're doing, uh, how you went into that line of business. In fact, it was in 2013 when the New Year program pro project was running in Northern Uganda. Mm. New Year yeah. is the Northern Uganda Youth Entrepreneurship Program. Okay. Yeah. I was, uh, I was ju just at the roadside. Then Enterprise Uganda was recruiting young boys and girls for training. Kay. I registered and we went for the training. And the training was for one week. After the training, they told us to go and start a business. And according to Enterprise, they have given us already the tools. What were the tools, the mm. training, the mm. skills? Mm. When I went back immediately the following day, I picked my hand up, went down the stream, I started digging a fish pond. 
You had a stream nearby? Yes, not very far mm. from. I started digging a fish pond. And according to their promise, that after three weeks, they will be coming to do mm -hmm. follow up. So after the three weeks, Enterprise Uganda came. We were in touch center. Then they gathered all of us who did the training. Then they asked, Have you started? <laughs> if you know you have started, raise up your hands. <laughs> I was among the people who raised up their hand. <laughs> you had dug your phone. <laughs> I dug a phone. And the phone was just 10 by 15 meters. Okay. Just for the start. Because I wanted, the time they come for fall half, there should be something. Because I received that training for one week. Okay. And I understood the message. So when I went, the following day, if you know you have started something, write your names here. Your location, your telephone number. The following day, follow up was there. They came, they follow up. That's how I started the business. I hear you. What was in that message, that first message from Enterprise Uganda, besides encouraging you to start a business? In fact, the, the biggest message that I got from Enterprise Uganda, we are just tied up with a rope. We just need to cut that rope. This mindset change. Mm. After the training, my mindset was tuned towards business. And I found that there was nothing impossible, just a matter of starting. Okay. Paint for us a picture, because I think uh, some of our viewers might be wondering um, how big your operation is, why you best. I mean, uh, give us an idea, because we know you are into fish farming. Yes, yes. What kind of fish is this? How is your operation like? In fact, uh, I started with a pond of uh, 15 by 10 by 15 meters. meters. As I speak now, have four ponds. The bigger one is 65 meters by 98 meters. Okay. That is the bigger one. I hear you. Then the mediums one, there are two. This 20 by 35 meters, there are two. Mm. Then there is one we use as selling point. This 10 by 15 meters. To someone who may not know much about fish farming, yes. the bigger one or the big one, yes. mm. what kind of capacity are we talking about in terms of fish it can hold? Mm. In fact, uh, there's what called stocking density in fish farming. A fish you stock according to the square meters. When you multiply 95 meters by 65 meters, that's bring you to the stocking them to the to the entire square meters of the pond. Mm. What do you do? There's a cross stocking density. How many fish can you put per square meters? Mm. So my pond initially it was undark, but as I speak now. We have excavated it because it used to what? To dry during the, the dry season. Mm. We brought an excavator. We excavated it. It's now four meters deep. Now you stock according to the cubic meters. Mm. Stocking then, according to technocrats, varies. Mm. Stocking density varies according to technocrats. Yeah. Mine is four meters deep, so I decided to put 10 per square meters. Mm. 10 fish. 10 fish. Mm. Per square meter. And the species I have. One is tilapia, mm -hmm. the nilotica, this one goes very fast. Mm -hmm. The second one is the miracap, it also goes very fast. The third one is the clarius, that is catfish. Yeah. Yeah. So you can hold it there, sim Charles. Mm. Yeah. Le let, me ju let him just give now the, the, the viewers that the, the big one, how many fish roughly are in, in that one? Yeah. In fact, uh, I have around 80,000. But you know what? 80,000. 80,000 fish. In the big but one? Fish multiplies. I hear you. Is it in the big one or the across big the one, The big one. Mm -hmm. oh yeah. That's the big one. Wow. Then those are the small, the, me the medium ones. Mm. I stock 12,000, 12,000. 12,000, 12,000. 12,000, I hear you. Yes. Mm. Give us an idea of your harvest and when you harvest. I mean, uh, what are we looking at in terms of volumes? In fact, uh, during my harvest, let me talk for this season. Yeah. No, we're in, a, we're, in a, we're, in a, we're in a crisis of corona, the pandemic. Yeah. Viewers, mm. you can see the pictures of Mr. Lawyer. At, uh, <laughs> yes. You know, uh, one of those are some of the mm. harvests from his ponds. Mm. Yes, please, you can go Yes. On. I stocked my fish last year, June. When corona came, I knew there was going to be scarcity of food. Mm. I was supposed to sell by, by fat. I tried to all on. As I speak in northern Uganda, where I come from, fish is a luxury, as I speak. Mm. We used to have customers, the community, mm. 
Then the people from the main market, Gulu Town, and then the, the, these other Wazungus, because uh, the place is full of Wazungus who are coming to do sport fishing. Mm -hmm. Now the people who can now afford the fish due to the lockdown are the Wazungus, and I'm charging them 15,000 per kg per kilograms. Wow. That is how I'm charging the Wazungus. Wow, mm. wow, wow, wow. Charles, what do you pick from uh, mm. Thomas's story? Thomas's story is an exciting story for this country. Exciting because we have a lot of youth. Exciting because we don't have enough resources to go around giving everybody something in terms of cash. Mm -hmm. But the story of Thomas just says that, please, can you reconfigure my mind? Can you give me hope? As he said, he was an, an idler who used to sit at the roadside. Like many young people today, they are saying a member of parliament is coming around 2 o'clock. So they sit under the trees knowing he will pass here. Mm. And when he passes here, he will leave us with some money because mm. we are the voters. Mm. A lawyer comes in and says, ah, this thing is here. The training is coming. He comes for the training. Mm. We call our training a tool. Mm. And we call it a tool because when you get the skills that we give you, they are usable immediately. When you have a hoe, you don't have to go and talk to an agricultural officer and say, please, yes, I bought a hoe. How do I use it? Mm -hmm. In the morning, you get up and just go and start digging. And that's exactly that what we did with Oloya. What is Oloya's story is giving us is this. The, 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 the water for starting a fish pond was always there. The land where you could dig the pond was always there. The finger links that could be put in the water, you could start with a few mm. that you can manage. Those were always there. What was missing was the mindset, the kind of a person who will say, I'm going to pick my hoe and go and start digging this thing myself. His resource was his energy, his time, his attitude. That is what this country needs to understand. That if we are going to spread the kind of energy that our, our lawyer is talking about, we need to start by reprogramming these young people's uh, mindsets. And he said he cut the rope. What we call cutting the rope in our training is removal excuses. Mm -hmm. Excuses of being young, excuses of having no capital, excuses of saying, what do I do? All those cut them off and get started with what you can start with without having to wait for anybody. I hear you. Thank you yeah. very much, Charles. Viewers on that note, we'll take a very short commercial break. When we come back, Ole is going to tell us the realities he's contending with to actually make this work. He's in real business, in the real world. We want to hear from him, and I'm sure you're going to be inspired after this break. To recharge energy With always don't miss out on a second of sleep Now with its 60% larger back Unlike cloth, get comfortable protection all night long Long days are fearless Here comes the bus lady Multitasking flawless My kids will get the best I'm a bus lady Always starts now with 2,000 shillings Stay happy always Welcome back, viewers. Again, we're talking about um, practical tips. This time around, we're looking at how you can be, especially the young people, the youth, move from unemployment to actually owning a chain of businesses. And we have the story of Thomas Oroya. He's not from Kampala. He's from northern Uganda. And he has, from where he sits, made it in the business world, but still aspiring to achieve more. Thomas, before we, got, uh, we went uh, for the break, we were talking about, uh, of course, Charles was uh, talking about the, you know, some of the issues that were coming out of your discussion. Yeah. But I think our viewers are interested also in knowing. I mean, in terms of production, 
Uh, you talked about the big pond, the small ponds. What are we looking at? I mean, in total today, how much fish do you have? And when you harvest, mm. what kind of harvest do you output? Yes, viewers. In fact, the bigger pond, as I stated before, I stock 80,000. 80. 80,000. Yeah. And this, this, uh, this, this tilapia, they do multiply. Mm. And as I speak, in the bigger pond, I can have to, up to, up to around 100,000 fish in the pond. Over 100,000? Over 100,000, because the pond is big. Okay. And you're talking about fish of about 15,000 each? In fact, the sport fishing I'm selling to this was at 17,000, not 15. Okay. 17,000. Mm. Per kilo. Then the, s the, the two smaller ponds, I stopped 12,000, 12,000. Mm. As I speak now, I believe I can now have to around 15,000, 15,000 in each pond. Mm. That's around 30,000 fish. Then the smaller pond, the smaller pond, is it, you have left it to be a selling point. You move from the bigger pond, you put them ready. When mm. someone comes, you sell from the small pond. Mm. Mm. It's easy now to harvest. Okay. Mm, yes. How did you get here? What were some of the challenges you had at the beginning and how did you cope? In fact, initially at the beginning, I had the pond, but I had no money to buy the fish. Okay. Mm -hmm. I had the pond, I could not even afford the fish. Technical services, I could not access it. Mm -hmm. Water pen. Mm -hmm. I went back, start molding. I started with molding of bricks to look for real money. Mm -hmm. I molded bricks of around 7,000. Burnt, sold the bricks. I started with 1,000 fish. That was Trinidad too. 1,000 fish. And I was feeding the fish with local feeds. Okay. We have local feeds. Local feeds are there. You don't need to come to this expensive feed from the market. Mm. But you can supplement it if you have the money. But if you don't have the money, you can use the local feeds. I hear you. Yes. Um, how did you, because you come from an area that is not well known for doing fish farming. Yes. How, do you deal, how did you deal with um, you know, the naysayers, the people who see you doing something strange and they're like, what is this man doing? I mean, a number of young people actually discouraged from uh, participating in certain businesses that will elevate them because of such people. How did you deal with that? In fact, they used to talk about me. They, are trying to, they try to de despise me. They lo and, and they look at me, where will this lawyer go with this fish business? Now, to their surprise, all hands are like this. <laughs> <laughs> You're employing them? I'm employing them. Charles, quick yes. lessons there. <laughs> now, this is an interesting submission from the young man again. When you are starting, you are not going to get ideal situations here. The ideal situation for a lawyer should have been to say, Somebody come and do for me these fish ponds, do the measurements properly, say, let me just dig it the way I can manage. Mm. When he finished doing that, he didn't have enough capital to get the fingerlings to put into that thing. And ideally, it would have been to say, uncle, I don't have capital. Mm. Uh, MP, I don't have money. That's a song. He capital. said, mm. no, I'm not going to wait for anybody. The bricks are here. I mean, the clay is here. People want bricks. And the bricks can be bought immediately. I finish burning them. His energy was sufficient to turn the clay into burnt bricks, sell them, bring the money, get the capital. Mm. That is the power of being an enterprising mindset. You begin to solve things. Mm. Innovativeness is integral to the journey of an entrepreneur. Mm. And those are the things we need to tell our young people that as you get into this business, ideal situations never come your way. Mm. He did what we call bridging business opportunities. Yeah. The bridging opportunity there was to burn bricks, sell the bricks, get the, the money. Mm. And then buy, when he was buying the feeds, he should have been saying, where is the ideal feed for fish? He said, what can feed my fish eat to grow? And he went for local Fits. materials. Mm. And with that, he started a fish building, I mean a fish farming business. If he was waiting for the ideal things up to today, the young man would be saying, you know what, the government has not yet released this <laughs> money. Or my uncle has not yet sent the money. Mm -hmm. The church is still working on how to get money from Europe for me. So I'm waiting for money. He is now at a point where he has 150,000 fish. Multiply that by 15,000. 
and get the picture we're talking about here. And that's just a kilogram because one yes. fish can weigh more than one kilogram. That's correct. Mm -hmm. The clarias can weigh from two to five. Yeah. In fact, let me add on something. Mm. Do you know what I did with the fish business? It, did, it is not easy to dig a, a big pond as I have. Mm. Big slaying was part of my project. Mm. The holes I converted into ponds. Interesting. You see? That's what I was <laughs> doing <laughs> for three years. <laughs> the pond was not dug in one day for mm. three solid years. That's good because uh, I can see a lot of business virtues in there. Patience and then of course optimizing all opportunity. Brick making was one of them. Yeah. Now on that note, I, I think you'll be the right person to put these questions to. Um, we've seen a number of government programs targeting the youth. Uh, from where you sit, um, how do you think this program should be crafted to benefit the youth? First of all, if government could really contact organizations like Enterprise Uganda, I think it would be better. Why Enterprise so? Uganda says, mm. we have the tools, but we are not going to give you the money. What are the tools? Supposing you give me your money, I'm not in business. Where do you think I'll take your money? Of course, I can bring it. Mm. First train someone, change their mind. Let him or her start the business. Mm. Then the money you have, support the business. I believe that those are some of the problems where government program is not materializing well. Secondly, government also always tells people, form a group, but there's what called group dynamics. People come with different intentions. And worst of all, for us in Uganda or Africa, we are very jealous. Mm. To do jobs properly as a group or as partnership it is very difficult. Mm. That is my experience. On that note, have you shared some of these experiences with your peers? I mean, especially, did you motivate some to join you at the beginning? Yeah, in fact, I have some friends who are also doing well. They never attended the training, but we are close friends mm. because they also have some small, small business. Now there are some are coping up. Mm. Friends are there. How are you coping under COVID-19? Because I'm sure it has brought certain challenges. Oh, it's opportunities for you. Yeah, COVID-19, the problem, the challenges are there. Mm. But the, the benefit also to me, it is also there. One of the challenges during this COVID-19 was transport. Because I have other businesses apart from the fish farm. Okay. I have diversified. Oh. I have a grow forestry in Omoro. Always, every time, every day, I don't miss going to see the project. Mm. I have Omoro. cereal growing also mm. in Omoro. Soya bean, beans and other things. So I always don't miss. What I always do, very early when I wake up, I first feed my chicken. Myself, very early. Chicken? Chicken, I have chicken also. Because yeah. the chicken droppings is also food for the fish. For the fish, interesting. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so yeah. I first feed my chicken. After I take tea, after taking tea, I move to the pond side. At times I feed my fish myself. I want to see how they are, they are growing. Immediately after finishing there, I give people work. Then I have to go to more. But this time, that movement, you cannot do it. Mm -hmm. There's a few time. So everything is in a mess. In fact, one greatest challenge that I have, uh, even now, you know, this COVID-19, some people are taking it as an opportunity. Mm. My land, where the fish pond is, the nearby land, you know, I bought some land near there. Someone came during this COVID, the president was saying, no movement, no what, what, what. Others were inspecting people's land, <laughs> including mine. Oh, no. My land was inspected. When I raised the complaint to the sub-county, <laughs> L3 chairman of Ongako, do you know what happened? Council sat down, emergency meeting was held, that the chairman land committee was suspended for three months. Mm. After the, the suspension, we went to the district before, the, because the file was already sent to the district. What happened? The district team came, the land officer and the cause office. They put back the man in the office. Then we went back. That one took me almost one month. I was not doing my work. Mm. Almost one month following land inspection, illegal land inspection. Mm. Now, what happened? These people wanted to pass the file. Now, no, we asked them, you have put this guy back in the office. Our complaints are there, it is even written. We are there with the complainants, we are here. What does it imply? Is there any chain of illegal land inspection from the sub to the district? Mm. So we wanted to protest. We were ready, we went with two vehicles. People are very many. 
Because that thing, now Google has become a city. That mess is there. Mm. If you are not careful, you find someone already having a title in your land. Good point, uh, <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> and let me finish a little. Mm. Then, I, then I conclude. Mm. Yes. Yes. So, if not bef because of the chairman file, it was a disaster. File mm. was deferred back. Now our case is before the district land board have set an inquiry mm. to come in. Yeah. The positive part of it, the locals used to be our customers, but they now look at fees as luxury. They cannot afford. Mm. Most of our customers nowadays are the Wazungus and the Chinese. So most of the fish that we used to sell at two thousand to the local three thousand five thousand is no longer there. We are selling fish at a tune of seventeen thousand, wow. and we have agreed. And many locals can't afford that. Many people can't afford. Mm. We used to give the community because of public relations. You need to have that good relationship mm. with the community. But now that they cannot afford, this was when they are coming in large number to do spot fishing because for them they want to fish themselves and they go and eat. Thank so you, Thomas. To a greater extent, it is more of a, an opportunity I to me but as uh, a farmer. I pick a very important aspect here. Uh, yeah. The environment under which our business operations sit. Mm. And I think uh, from a policy perspective, where now government needs to come in to make it easy for such operators, especially young people like him. Mm. I don't know what your lessons are out of that discussion. Mm. I think one clear lesson is that um, challenges do not spare even a young person who has yeah. gone into business. Yeah. Challenges does not even <coughs> do not even spare somebody who's located in a difficult region. Mm. You still receive these challenges. The other thing that comes out of it is that he did not quickly surrender and just say leave it all to God. Mm. He pursued the case and said, I'm going to pursue my rights to the limit. To the end. He's small bodied, but you could see the, the, the kind of steel and the energy inside him. Mm. It tells you that no matter what you who you are, mm. I'm coming for you until we get the thing to work out properly. Mm. But the bigger picture is this, that um, we need to work on those aspects that affect young people like him from doing a good job mm. in business. Mm. But he also shared something that I think many other young people would openly and readily share. Yeah. He said doing business as young people, as a group, is not easy. Many of them, you don't know their intentions. Many of them have got a spirit of jealousy. Mm. And if you are a young person, you are still trying to pick up the groups on how to run a business properly, but you're also dealing with these dynamics that are totally diversionary. Mm. It's a very tough game. It is. So should we abandon the group thing? Maybe not. But as we make ma young people go into groups like a lawyer, let us educate them on how to make these groups to work. Mm. Because even two adults find it tough to be together for three years, five <laughs> years, ten, five, ten, ten years. Even some marriage. I'm even sure from that has been one of the impacts of who COVID. are the a bondage of love. Yes. Even this find it tough sometimes to sustain the game yes. for a longer period. Yeah. So I think it touched on something very, very fundamental as we talk about this thing of saying form a group. Yeah. The yeah. group dynamics mm. are not easy to manage. Mm. Very, very, very good. Um, now, your business is located within the communities. Within the communities. Um, Paint for us that picture. How are you able to do that business and then at the same time be able to maintain that good relationship within the community? First of all, my staffs are the community people. Mm. Secondly, all, almost most of the schools come to the place to do field work, mm. the students. So it is now a learning center for students. Mm. So the, the community people, they are somehow happy. Three, it is also a training hub for the farmers. Mm. I'm training farmers, where people who are doing fish farming mm. at the site. I hear you. So to a certain extent also, I've also addressed the problem of malnutrition. Mm. Yes. So in other words, you're not only just looking at the profit you're getting out of this fish, but you also know that you are part of the community, and then there has to be something trickling down to that community. It is that. I think, again, he touches something that we need to be drumming up each time we talk about private sector or mm. entrepreneurship. Yeah. Be it for young people, be it for people who are retiring and going into business. Whatever you do, seek to be of benefit and transformation to the community where you operate. Yeah. Be of benefit to the community, seek to transform that community. Mm. As you do that, invariably, yeah. the rewards that come in terms of money will come your way. Mm. As you heard him saying, now, 
the, the, the Chinese go there to do what he calls fishy sport tourism. Yeah. 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 He calls fishing. it is sport yeah. fishing. Yeah. Each time you throw your, 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 your hook there and you capture a, a fish, he says that fish, no matter the size, 17,000. It is a money in two million dollars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> you are the one who caught it. Yes. You have enjoyed the game, mm -hmm. but also, please, the price for that is a combination of your enjoyment plus the fish you are taking home, 17,000 shillings. Yeah. So the moment you go into business with that broadness of outlook, you have such a big opportunity to make good money, mm -hmm. but also be received and accommodated by the community that you, 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 you work with. Okay. Now, I understand... Uh, uh, Thomas, that you've been selected, you know, um, or, or picked, you've already started getting a listing interest from international players mm -hmm. um, beyond the confines. First of all, just your locality, but even Uganda. Um, how did this happen? And uh, share with us your experience. In fact, that was 2013, 2015, not 13. Mm. It was my first trip to Europe. Okay. I got an air ticket saying your trip to Switzerland is fully confirmed. No message was sent. Then I was asking, who sent me this air ticket? Because I didn't know what air <laughs> ticket was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Then mm. I, when I came back home, I asked this Wazungu who were doing sport fishing with me. Mm. Are you the one who sent me the, the air ticket? Mm. And they said no. And then I was asking, what is air ticket? Then immediately, when they told me they're not the ones who sent me the air ticket, then I called Enterprise Uganda. Do you have any knowledge about this air ticket? <laughs> that is yes. <laughs> US tourists has attracted international interest. Then I said, fine. Then I he said, come to Kampala and you prepare your visa. So when I came, he wrote, he wrote me a letter to go to the embassy. When I went, I prepared my visa. Mm. I was supposed to travel on the 15th because we had a presentation on the 19th. On the 15th, I came. I was already in Kampala. Then there I had a challenge. I don't know what happened. My visa date was different from the air ticket date. I stayed in Entebbe Airport for three days minus sleep. Why I wanted to go to <laughs> Switzerland. <Wow. laughs> Till when this folk <laughs> sent me another ticket, the anchored people, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Till when they sent me another ticket, I traveled. I was late because we I was supposed to stay in, in Switzerland for three days, then the following day presentation. I was the last speaker, so me and my bags, everything, I didn't even change for three days. And From the highs were very, very straight to the conference yeah. room. Mm -hmm. and, and you delivered your message. And I delivered my message. I was from Uganda. There was a lady from DR Congo. Then there was also a gentleman mm. from British Columbia. That's powerful. But I, I match a winner. Mm. <laughs> After that, <laughs> others <laughs> came back. They took me to World Trade Center to go and share my experience. Mm. World Trade Center. World Trade Center. After there, they took me to Ban Ki Moon office. It was amazing mm. journey. Ban Ki Moon. Ban Ki Moon. I hear you. <laughs> Charles, um, yes. what is there for our young people from this amazing story? This is what uh, this country needs to be hearing, and I hope men are going to really get inspired by this kind of a story. Where there is success, it is speaks way ahead of the creator of success. Mm. Our lawyer was continuing with his fish, mm. with his soya, with his chicken, with his, trip, with his trees, doing his normal job. But the story was traveling. Mm. Now, the moment success is noticed, location, whatever, will never be the limitations. Mm. This man had to be taken by all means, despite all the challenges he met. Mm. He met. Geneva said, let's do all it takes to get a lawyer to be in Geneva. Mm. Because a story where somebody starts with himself and begins to attract resources, even in terms of US dollars, mm. by the time you talk of 800 million per year in Ugandan terms, yeah. even by the dollar terms, you are way past $200,000 per year. Absolutely. And you started with basically your energy, yeah. you deserved to be put on the highest pedestal possible. So all I'm telling our young people is that it may be painful to go through the initial stages, but the rewards, the benefits, the recognition are more than a compensation for all those ups and downs that you'll have, you'll have gone through. Perfect. 
So, um, so Lea, how do you see, because you could be, actually you're the right person to be asked this question, um, the need for capital and support in terms of schools, uh, of skills for our young people, the youth, um, how do you think this should be crafted or designed for it to deliver? Yes. First of all, the young, the young boys and girls, the youth, mm. needs to be trained. Mm. And the number one choice of capital, it is you yourself, it is me. Then other organizations like Enterprise Uganda, mm. who support skills training, should give more, should continue supporting people with capacity building. Because we have other youths who are still under incubation, they need that training. I hear you. Then yeah. when it comes to capital, give us capital at a low interest rate, or even no interest rate, mm -hmm. or even a grant. Mm -hmm. But when someone has already done business, mm -hmm. you don't just give money to someone to go and start. That one, they're just throwing your money. Mm -hmm. I hear you. That's they need, they need to have the knowledge about you what they're you going you to do. You need to have the knowledge. Powerful. Now, um, you're doing business in a community, home, yes. yeah? And many people, um, when they do business from such environments, they tend to have a bit of unfair competition. Sometimes it's jealousy uh, in African setting. There's so many things to contend with. And this is reality. Mm. Even African chemistry yes. <laughs> in certain <laughs> realities, for lack of a better word. <laughs> how, do you, how did you manage to transpire over all this and stay focused and reach where you are today? In fact, uh, that unfair competition to me, I could just say, oh, those are funny competitors. Mm. That's the language I could use. Those are funny competitors. Competition in business is all about improving quality. Okay. That's why I look at it. People used to despise me. People want to look at me. And today I'm very smart, by the way. I'm a simple man. Yeah. And my life is simple. Mm. Don't brag if you're doing business. A business passion, you don't brag. Calm down. I don't even drive. That's interesting. You see that? I don't drive. Mm. I'm and, focused. And it's a choice you make. I know my vision mm. and the mission. Mm. But time will come. Everything will be out. Charles. These are words that could only be uttered by people who have been in business for 20, 30, 50 years. Yeah. For this to be coming out of a young man from a muru a young man who has begun to make hundreds of millions of shillings yeah. per year away from the capital city called Kampala. Now they are, they are in a, a city called Gulu. <laughs> yes. These words are simply super. Um, when he's, he, 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 he noted what competition is, and if you look at it from the way the Japanese are doing, it's exactly what he has just said. Mm. A Japanese will make sure that as soon as the, the newest pickup called Toyota has come out, Nissan people will be the first to, to buy it. Yeah. And they are going to buy it so as to see what has Toyota done better. Mm -hmm. And they get that message to the people in the, in the factory, yeah. the research unit, to quickly improve the next unit of Nissan. Mm -hmm. And when the Nissan releases their most modern pickup, Toyota will be the, among the first to buy it. To see what Nissan has done. And if you did that continuously, the entire economy, the entire country, becomes a super competitive nation. He put it plainly, he said, competition is about improving quality. Mm. A lawyer, you should be captured in a, a management book because this is not something that I not got it that way. Mm. But now reflecting on how we normally train people on competi competition, this is another way of stating the same thing that we usually tell people. Don't focus on the... Mm. competition focus Correct. on the quality of your keep improving that quality mm. and how do you do that you check the competition has done something a bit good how do you pick up that one and add what you have and get better if they pick what they have learned from you and they have moved on again you also again pick from them and improve on that one mm -hmm. what happens to the entire community you all go up mm. instead of jealousy keep improving quality now he also goes and gives medicine for the neighbors who will be saying, but oh lawyer, we used to be together at the roadside. How does he try to stem that kind of agony or spirit of jealousy that comes for people? He said simplicity. Mm -hmm. No bragging. Be calm. <laughs> a car is not a big story. 
<laughs> he just touches. If I were to put another Uganda and that exactly use this kind of words, it was the late Mulwana James. Thank you, Charles. Um, yeah. Very, very powerful uh, uh, message there on, uh, you know, being humility, really. Yeah. Um, viewers, I would pick about two, three calls. Um, you can put your question to Mr. Lawyer, and um, he's here to answer. He's an expert in his area, in his own right, but um, we'll just pick one or two. However, before I go to the calls, um, Mr. Lawyer, um, do you have any family members involved in your business? Yes. How do you manage that? Sometimes family can be a bit of a trick. Wonderful. Most businesses collapse mm -hmm. because they fail to bring their relatives in the business. Mm -hmm. There are four things you have to do, and it's very important to have a, a relative, your son, or your daughter in your business. First of all, employ your relatives, your son, your daughter, based on skills, mm -hmm. ability, and positive attitude towards work. If you do that, check the negative attitude. Mm, sorry, I'll cut you short a bit. I have a call on the line who's burning with a all question. Right, right, right. Um, uh, please give us your name and uh, question. Mm, hello. Hello. You live hello? on NTV. Please give us your name and question. <coughs> hello. Sorry, I think we, are, we have a problem with the line. Yes, you are still continuing. Secondly, you take that the negative attitude my father's business, mm. my uncle's business. Check that one, work on it. I hear you. Thirdly, pay your relative, your son, your daughter equal share when it comes to salary. Very good. That will spread the spirit of unfairness. Very good, Oloya. Sorry, uh, I'll cut you short a bit. Yes. Yeah, dear viewers, please, um, viewer, give us your name or question. Hello? You live on NTV, please give us your question. Thank you. I'm called from Moyo. Yes, please. Go ahead with your name, yes. rather with your question. My question actually goes to Mr. Charles. Okay. I want to say, if you can, I said I'm called Victor. I'm calling from Moyo. Yes, please. Oh. All right, uh, dear viewers, when you come in, please go straight to the question. Yeah. Hello, viewer. Yes, what would be your question? Hello. You're live on huh? NTV. Hello. Hello, NTV. Yes, hello. Please give us your question. Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Sorry, I think we seem to hello? have a problem, a challenge with the lines. Yes, Mr. Then, Lea, we're lastly, what I can say about relatives in business. Mm. Give your relative, your son, your daughter, hard task. Mm. Why? They are the future wealth owners. Mm. They are not just employers. Mm. So that your business becomes a generational business. business. Beautiful. For instance, mm. look at the Israeli. How are they doing business? Today, your father buys like three goats. Your son, the following day, comes and adds on another 10. Then your grandson comes and adds on another 15. Mm. That one becomes a generational project. Mm. Look at the Muindi. You find four Indians in one shop in Kampala here. Can and actually stay four of them in one shop to sell. At the end of the day, they will be stealing. Mm -hmm. Live alone on an actually. In Uganda, generally, even in Kampala here, mm. can that one happen? No. Mm -hmm. We need to build one flat, leave others for the children. The children continue. That is why when a rich man always dies, he dies with the business together. Why? We don't have a succession plan. plan. Powerful. Charles. Yes. What do you take from that? Um, Thomas is a gift to enterprise Uganda to the young people to this country. When you hear the word that you use here, a business owner must have an outlook which says, I want to build a generational enterprise. Mm -hmm. And to him, and that's the way it should be, 
a generational enterprise should be one that keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You had one shop with a capital of 100 million. By the time your children are also handing over that shop to another, to the next generation, that shop should be at a billion shillings. Mm -hmm. By the time the grandchildren are handing over to the great grandchildren, the, the one billion sh shilling empire should be at 10 billion. If you do that, you have really buttressed your success. Mm -hmm. The roots are deep, the skills are passed down the line, the pride of being an entrepreneur is celebrated. Mm -hmm. And that's a great thing to have. Mm -hmm. Rather than saying, what do we do with these resources of daddy? Can I take this? Can I take this? And then you divide and destroy the empire soon after the departure of the founder. I hear you. Um, I, again, still have uh, some people on the line. Please give us your name and uh, question. Don't listen to yourself speaking on the TV. Just go to the question, listen through the phone and um, be part of the discussion. Hello, caller. Hello. Hello. Please, your question and name. Hello. Hello, you live on NTV. My name is Grace. I'm commonly known as the fish girl. Mm -hmm. I am, I'm so happy. I, I think I'm on. Yes, you are. Oh. Now, I, I, want, I want to thank Mr. Chichi for the program. I, I did one of the Enterprise Uganda trainings in 2007. Mm -hmm. I was just a girl on the streets. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm a CEO and I supply supermarkets. Because of the competences I got from their trainings in Masaka, I would commute from Kono to Masaka to go and get that knowledge. And up to now, I feel they are the foundations that are running my business, the trainings I got. Now, my question is, I want, I am even dreaming, I want to be the first one to be satisfied with UNBS in Mukene business, commonly known as Silverfish. Silverfish yes. I supply, but the process is too hard and it involves a lot of money and I'm struck I'm working I'm there I have my production unit I'm working with them but it needs money sometimes you really need that push is there a way where we can be recommended to apply or supported so that we can have a product satisfied otherwise thank you for the program i've been here watching and i've learned more it's not about covid actually it's yeah. about how you you get inspired to get more skills in our businesses thank you so much guys and thank but you we've missed a lady we should have had a lady there in between <laughs> it's only men there we but know thank my, you so much we know i do grace but yeah <laughs> point taken thank you yes um i think we'll pick another caller maybe yes. one or two before yes. we come back yes uh, Yes, please give us your name and uh, question. Hello? Hello, you're live on NTV. Please give us your name or question. Hello. 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 Please Hello. go direct to the yes. question. Sorry, I think we, 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 I'll pick another one. Please go direct to the question when you go through, because we have a number of people on the line. Hello? 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 Please, what is your question? You're live on NTV. Uh, uh, this is Robert from Fatpato. Yes, Robert. Yeah, I would like to know, I have, I have a, a, a pond of 10 to 15 meters. I would like to know how many fish I, I could put them. Okay. I could put in that pond because I'm starting that project. I need the knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That question has been taken. I'll pick, I think, one more caller and then yeah. we come back mm -hmm. here. You're live on NTV. Give us your question. Yes. Hello. 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 Your question, please. Yes, I'm Ibrahim from Deje. Yes, Ibrahim. Mm. I would love to know where can I find uh, the enterprise Uganda? Where can I find you and 
I have I have something to share with you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much, um, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman from Fort Porto needs some uh, yeah advice there. Some advice. The gentleman from Fort Porto, Robert, says he has a phone of ten by fifteen meters. Mm -hmm. He want to stalk. What should he do? My brother Robert, stalking dance devices. That is according to the technocrats. Mm -hmm. Always you stalk. Like, like, let me say the example of mine, and I advise him. Mm. Mine, the depth is four meters, deep. but you deep. Mm -hmm. So, per square meter, I can stock ten. Okay, depends on the depth of each spawn, also. Mm. Mm. You by stocking density varies from four, starts from four, even from two, mm. depends how the your pawns are. So, it is good for him to consult the technocrat to go and take measurements. Mm. Of his fish ponds. Mm. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. Charles, mm. you mm. have Grace there asking, mm. and then yeah. a gentleman who wants your address. Let me first thank Grace. Grace is one of those stories that we, we are really very proud, and actually, she's one of those people we can come and bring right here. Yeah. Grace has been able to perfect the fish selling business until now. It's a profession that has taken fish to prime outlets like Capital Shoppers, ShopRite. Grana fish is found there. Mm well-packed, well-processed, decently delivered, the lady is super. And I want to thank Grace for continuing, despite that achievement, to strive to get better. Yeah. She wants to get this, the UNBS mark. This is the kind of a story where the entire country should rally and just say, this is an F D D D I, mm -hmm. a domestic direct investor. Yeah. How do we support them? We have a lot of things that we are trying to do for the FDI, the foreign direct investor. Mm -hmm. Grace is simply saying, UNBS is a government entity. I am here, I'm doing something that is groundbreaking. Help me, I want to cross the line, and I want to fulfill the quality aspirations of fish, so that the fish which is processed, value added, mm -hmm. can leave this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Grace, we hear you, and <coughs> we will pick it up as Enterprise Uganda, <coughs> and do whatever it takes. Yeah to support a person like Grace to become a success story for this country. Yeah. So I will commit myself and Grace, let's talk within one week so that we can get a chat with the UNBS. And if possible, if there's an issue about a budget from UNBS, then we need to talk to the Minister of Finance to get to a point when we can begin to support our own entrepreneurs to become great and become international mm. in terms of quality certification. Yeah. Ibrahim, I can give you my telephone number right now. My number is 0772-699-808. And we would be more than glad to get in touch with you and see how we can be of help to you, like the way we have been to Ms. Oloya and th thousands of others who have gone through the hands of Enterprise Uganda. I hear you. Thomas, do you ever export some of this fish? I know there you have South Sudan market. We have the Congo market. I, I understand fish is a delicacy in Congo. In fact, uh, not yet. Why? When you, in fact, northern Uganda, when you, when you, when you see where Gula and Omoro is, we are very far from the lake. The demand for fish is enough. It, in it is not even enough. There is scarcity. I hear you. I still have callers on the line. So we'll give them, we want you to be part of this discussion. So I'll pick uh, another caller. Um, just go direct to the question when you come through. Yeah. Hello? Can you reduce the volume? Sorry, I think I've lost that one. Please reduce the volume of your TV set when you come through. Just go direct to the question. Hello? Hello, caller. Hello. Yes, give us your name and question, please. Hello, MTV. Hello. Hello. Yes. Your question, please. Hello. Sorry. I, I, th I think we have... Uh, Hello. Hello. Can you give us Hello, your question, hey. please? Hello. Sorry. I think uh, we have a problem with the line on that one. Uh, another caller. Uh, please, when you come through, reduce the volume of your TV set and just give us your question. I have lost that one. Yeah, um, Charles, um, mm. you know, in the previous discussions, we talked about exports, rather imports of fish from Taiwan. But maybe before I come in, I'll just pick this one caller. Hello? 
Hello, give us your name and question, please. I'm called Helen. Uh, my question is, Ms. Oloya said that you use local feed. I would like to know what are the local feeds she uses to feed the fish. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. I'll pick another caller. So when you come, when you go through, please give us your name and question. Just go direct to it. Hello. Hello, your name and question, please. Your name and question. Let's go direct. I'm called Sany Ismail. I'm here in Mengo. Hello, your name and question, please. Yes, I'm called Sany Ismail. Please don't listen to yourself on the TV screen. Just but I, ha I wanted to, uh, to start a project eh, of fishing. Ah. Hello? Sorry, I, I think it's but I'm sure he wants tips on how to go about yeah. starting that project. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Charles, uh, yeah. you, I think, let's start with Ms. Oloya. What local feeds are we talking about? The local feeds. You know, if you are to go into fish farming and you concentrate on these other feeds here that you buy, the pellet, the starter, the trimester, mm. there's no way you can make profit in fish farming. Okay. You have to supplement. One of the feed is chicken droppings. There you go. Okay. The second one is the cow down. You know, when, when they float, they form some, uh, some moles down the pond. In form in we call them the planktons. They are like plankton, fish plankton. Three, even these potato leaves, they eat. The cassava leaves, they eat. The yams leaves, they eat. Even this marua waste is very nutritious. Mm. So there are so <laughs> many <laughs> local feeds. I hear you. But <laughs> do you know how to discover that? The technocrats don't know that. When you're in the field, that's how you get the experience. It's some of them, they're not, there, they're not written in the books. So there's some my knowledge which is not written in the book. That is why there was a time when the minister came to my place. And, and I asked her that question. Why is it that the fishery officers don't even have a a square meter of a fish pond. What experience do they have? Mm. 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 That was my question to the minister. Thank you, Thomas. I think it was uh, quite an interesting one, experience there. Charles, um, what do we pick from this? Fundamental uh, learning in there, there are two. Yeah. Every engagement that you undertake to do as a business person has got key success factors. Yeah. Learn them quickly from those who have done it. By talking to a lawyer, you begin to see how a lawyer has overcome the aspect of costly processed feeds. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you go and pick a fish. When you see the fish that he has produced compared to a fish that has eaten the other alternative feeds, no difference. Learn from the person who has gone through the game. Mm -hmm. Get the key success factors. Do not, the other thing is, do not be limited by your circumstances. Mm -hmm. Innovation always gives us room to come up with other working solutions. Mm -hmm. And over time, those other working solutions, one time, will become the standard way of doing things. He's talking about Malwa. Mm -hmm. Who would ever put Malwa in a, a textbook written by an Australian? <laughs> yeah. Who would ever put potato leaves in a textbook for feeding fish written by somebody in Israel? Mm -hmm. Israel has got no potato leaves. Mm. But here is a person who is saying, we had this kind of thing, somebody did it, and it has worked. I've also done it, it is working. The key element there is be interested in your game, be interested in getting the right solution to your customer, but above all, remain a learner. Remain a learner. The day you think you now know it, you're in trouble. I hear you. That's when you think you know it, that's when you lose everything. Correct. You're parting short, Thomas. What would be your last word? My last word. Fellow entrepreneurs, the young boys, the world is already carried by God. Mm. The greatest poverty I've seen in this world is poverty of the mind. It is expressed as I can't. It is impossible. Mm. Therefore, be it you want or not, you need to start doing something mm. to enterprise Uganda. I'm who I am now because of Enterprise Uganda. Bringing me from all that far, I had them to 
have that continued support for the youth. That is my message. I hear you. And to the youth, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Mm. Thank you. Charles, what would be your last word today? I think today is an interesting aspect of this uh, Sunday afternoon because we started with mature people. Yeah. And people were beginning to say, well, these are people who have a long story. These are people who are taking over from mm. the founding people. Those were useful stories. Yeah. Today we have had somebody who began from literally nothing. And he started way out of Kampala. And he's talking of figures that are decent, respected, irrespective of which economy you are talking about. Mm -hmm. And he has been given international recognition. The message is clear. If you want to create an entrepreneur, you create an entrepreneur first and foremost through the mindset. Mm -hmm. The rest are important, but they must find a mindset ready and knowing where it is headed to. Short of that, as he said, if people reach money, like we have all tried to support our relatives, our young people, they get this money, they say, this is the time I, I will buy the shoe I've been missing to get. This is the time for him to get the watch I've been missing to get. It is time to go for a smartphone. But look at the man. He says, he even with all the money that he's now having, he says, mm. it's not about the money, it's about transforming the society. The society. Mm. So the message is clear. It is possible to create an entrepreneur. But as we go for that game, it is starts and ends with a mindset. Thank you very much, Charles. Mm. Dear viewers, that's all we've had time for you this afternoon. I know my phones are still blazing, uh, but we'll be picking that discussion from there next Sunday. I've been your host, Charles Boji, with Charles Ochichi and Thomas Oloya. I'm sure you've picked quite a number of lessons from today's interface. Have a good evening. God bless.